Good morning and welcome to worship from Mount Pleasant Baptist Church here in Northampton. You know, in these days that are so difficult for many to find any moorings in life, we're so grateful as Christians that God's word is so applicable to our lives and gives us what we need in order to help us become fully devoted followers of the Lord Jesus. That's why our church exists. That's our uh, means of glorifying God, helping one another daily to be more like Jesus as we're able. And God's word has so much practical advice. And we're going to be looking over the next few weeks at a few verses from the letter of Jude. Now, last week, I wrongly attributed uh, this new series to the book of Titus. I'd been reading it just before I came on air to record uh, but the book of Jude is written to Christians who are tempted uh, to give up on their faith that they've been given and taught about and to look for the nearest fad, the latest fad, or the easiest path. But our desire, particularly as we come to worship God and to acknowledge his greatness, is that he would help us to stay faithful to him just as he is faithful to us. And over the next six weeks, that's what we hope to do. Today, we're going to be having a look at what the book of Jude is all about. We're going to be worshipping God. We're going to be praying for our world. I invite you now to join me with prayer as together we seek to acknowledge the presence of the Lord with us at all times and in all places. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we come this morning to worship, we're aware that sometimes our heart is cold. But we pray that you would warm it with the fire of your love. Father, we're aware that sometimes as we come into your presence, we become aware not only of your greatness, but also of our sinfulness. And so as we come to you this morning, we pray uh, that you would cleanse us by your precious blood. And by reminding us of the depth of love that led Jesus to the cross to die for us. And Father, we're aware sometimes that our heart is weak. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would strengthen us this morning. That as we worship you, Lord, we may be filled with your divine presence. So Lord, captivate our hearts and make us attentive to what you want to say to us today. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together in saying the words which Jesus gave us as a pattern for prayer, whatever language or form is common for you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord my God, I called out to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a minute, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may re remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O Lord, when you favoured me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called. I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, I will give my thanks to you forever. So as I've mentioned, we're going to be looking over the next few weeks at the book of Jude. And our friends at the Bible Project have come up with an introductory video which gives us an overview of some of the themes in the book, as well as beginning to root of the teaching of God's word in the letter of Jude um, to be a means by which our lives can be blessed today. So let's watch this video together and see how it may speak to us as we seek to be open to the Lord's leading. Let's watch this together. The letter of Jude, or more accurately, Judah, according to the pronunciation of his name, both in Greek and in Hebrew. Judah was one of Jesus' four brothers who are named in the Gospel accounts. None of the brothers followed Jesus as the Messiah before his death, but afterwards they saw him alive from the dead and then became his disciples. All these brothers of Jesus became leaders eventually in the first Jewish Christian communities, and Judah was known as a traveling teacher and missionary. And this gives us the background to understand the purpose of his letter. We don't know what specific church community he wrote to, but it was likely made up of mostly Messianic Jews. His writing style assumes a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, as well as other popular Jewish literature. Jude had become aware of a crisis facing this church, and so this helps us understand the letter's design. It begins with an opening charge, followed by a long warning and accusation against corrupt teachers who had influenced this church. And then Judah closes by completing the charge about what this church is supposed to do. Judah begins by charging this church to contend for the true Christian faith. He says his plan was to write a longer work that explored our shared salvation through the Messiah. But that project, he says, got delayed when he heard the urgent news about this church, and so he fired off this very thoughtful but very short letter. Judah doesn't begin with how they're supposed to contend for the faith. Rather, he first goes into why. It's because of the corrupt teachers who have infiltrated this church. And it's not their teaching that he targets, but their way of life. Their moral compromise is what tells you they have bad theology. First of all, they've distorted God's grace as a license to sin. They think that they're forgiven and they have God's spirit, so now they can do whatever they want, especially when it comes to money and sex. And so Judah says they betray Jesus by rejecting his authority and his teachings. And Judah wants this church to know that the appearance of these teachers is no surprise. He transitions into a longer warning to stay away from them. He first offers two sets of three Old Testament examples. The first trio is about rebellious people who in the past received divine justice. So the Israelites who rebelled against God in the wilderness, they got what they wanted and they died out in the middle of nowhere. Then he brings up a story about angels who are imprisoned for rebellion until they face God's justice. He's referring to the interpretation of the story in Genesis 6 offered in the popular Jewish work called First Enoch, where the sons of God are interpreted to refer to angels who rebelled against God, then had sex with women and were judged accordingly. Judah links this story to his third example about the ruin of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, where violent men tried to have sex with angels. Both these stories are about rebellion against God's order that led to sexual immorality, and that's precisely what the corrupt teachers are guilty of. 
After this, Judah brings up a bonus example from a popular Jewish text called the Testament of Moses. Like Enoch, it was not part of the Old Testament scriptures, and it was a creative retelling of Moses' final days and words based on Deuteronomy. In the section that Judah quotes from, Moses has died, and there's a good angel, Michael, who is refuting the devil's accusations against Moses, but he decides to leave final judgment for God alone. Now, these stories might seem kind of odd to you, but for Jewish people who were raised on this literature, Judah's warnings make good sense. The behavior of these corrupt teachers has ancient roots, rebellion against God's authority, sexual immorality, rejecting God's messengers. And this connects to the second trio of examples. They're all about rebels who went on to corrupt other people. So Cain, he murdered his brother, but then he went on to build a city where violence reigned. Balaam, the sorcerer, he couldn't curse Israel, and so he lured them into idolatry and sexual corruption. And then Korah, the Levite, he led a rebellion against Moses that ended in disaster for others. Judah concludes the second trio with a barrage of Old Testament images to describe the teachers. They're like the selfish shepherds of Ezekiel, or like the clouds with no rain from Proverbs, or like the chaotic waves from Isaiah. Their self-absorption betrays their claim to follow Jesus. They create chaos wherever they go. Judah concludes his warning by quoting from two other warnings, one ancient and one recent. The first comes, again, from the popular book of First Enoch, which claimed to contain the visions of the ancient figure Enoch from the book of Genesis. Now, what's fascinating is Judah quotes from the opening chapter of Enoch, which is itself quoting about half a dozen Old Testament texts about the final day of the Lord's justice on human evil. Judah then matches Enoch's ancient warning with a more recent one from the apostles. Peter, John, Paul, they all predicted that corrupt teachers would arise and distort the good news about Jesus. And they themselves were echoing Jesus' early warning about the same thing. And so this church should need no more convincing. These teachers have to be dealt with. So Judah then moves into his closing charge. He picks up his opening line about contending for the faith, and he unpacks how to do so with a cool set of metaphors. He describes the community of Jesus as God's new temple. And so they are to build their lives on the foundation of the most holy faith, which refers to the core message of good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for our sins. On that foundation, the church is to build itself through a dedication to prayer, by devoting itself to the love of God through obedience. And the integrity of this building will be maintained by staying alert for the return of Jesus to bring his justice and his mercy. And in doing this, they will help each other stay faithful to Jesus. Judah then concludes by praising the God who will protect his people and keep them from falling too far from his grace. The short letter of Judah is powerful and puzzling for many modern readers who ask why he quotes from texts that aren't today considered part of the Hebrew Bible, like First Enoch or the Testament of Moses. It's important to remember that Jewish culture in this time was immersed in religious texts. Jesus, his family, all the early Jewish Christians grew up reading the Hebrew Bible along with many later books that were based on and inspired by the scriptures. And we know there were ancient debates about whether or not some of these later books should be viewed as scripture, but regardless, they're still important. A book doesn't have to be in the Bible to speak an important message to God's people. And so we have many Jewish texts from this period. They're known today as the collections of the Apocrypha, also called the Deuterocanon, along with the Pseudepigrapha. These were all preserved and read in Jewish and Christian communities. They were treated with great respect. It doesn't mean they were originally designed as part of the Hebrew Bible, but they are part of the biblical tradition. And so Judah, Knowing his readers that they would value words from First Enoch, he used them to communicate his message, which is this. God's grace through Jesus demands a whole life response, not just intellectual assent. Notice that Judah doesn't criticize or focus on the teacher's theology, but their immoral way of life, which denies Jesus. And so Judah is here applying what Jesus first told his disciples. If you really love me, then you will obey my teachings. For Christians, how you live is the most reliable indicator of what you actually believe. And that's what the letter of Jude is all about. Good morning. The Bible reading today is from the book of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, 
to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, abound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals. These are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn leaves without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved for ever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.
So let's uh, begin our series by praying and asking the Lord to speak with us as we look at the letter of Jude and as we ask for God's help in applying it to our lives today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that we have the freedom to openly talk about and study your word and apply it to our lives. May it help us today and every day to glorify Jesus in our lives and to let other people know that you love them so very, very much. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We like to think so often, don't we, of the early church as being a time, uh, a golden era in the history of Christianity. And indeed, um, people can sometimes look at the book of Acts and the years immediately following Um, with rose-tinted spectacles. But the truth is that the time of the early church was also a time where there was division, opposition, persecution, and the church was scattered during this time uh, to the four corners of the Roman Empire because of the great ejection of Christians out of Rome. And actually what happened seemed at first to be like a very negative and destructive step turned out to be a means by which the gospel was spread and so we can often reflect on how God turns situations like this into opportunities for gospel growth but even though we we think of this time as great growth the powerful presence of the spirit generous giving by believers there were false teachers and the health of the church was at risk. Indeed, one could almost say that the gospel itself was in very great danger. Things are going wrong. There's disunity. There's opposition from within as well as without the church. And a temptation for these believers uh, to follow a different gospel and not to be so dedicated in their mission to see more people come to know that Jesus really was the Messiah and that he is Lord of heaven and earth. So they were tempted to believe something that was more popular. It seemed to have more credence by certain people who put themselves forward as wise, as experts. And so Jude writes, he wants to write to encourage, he says. He wants to build them up. But first, he's got to deal with the difficulties. And so he writes this letter. They are prone to wander from the authentic gospel of Jesus. That's a temptation for the church down through the ages. The sin of fadism, of running after the latest theory 
or the latest doctrine or the latest philosophy. But Jude says to them, the only way in which you are going to honour Jesus, the only way in which you not only believe, but believe uh, honestly and faithfully, is in verse 3, when he says, Beloved, while eagerly preparing to write to you about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write an appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once delivered, once entrusted to the saints. And so that's where we start our series. That's where we seek today to apply God's word into our lives, both as individuals and as a church community at Mount Pleasant. How can we contend for the faith and build ourselves up? Verse 20 of Jude says this, You, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. That's a challenge for us. And so how can we meet that challenge? I want to suggest to you three ways. Firstly, lay firm foundations. Verse 20 says, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Be loyal to the gospel. Somebody once said, the gospel that keeps you best is the gospel that saved you. Stand on the promises of God in his word, where God promises to forgive to redeem, to restore, to renew, and to resurrect all those who put their trust fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be faithful to what we would call orthodox, with a small o, orthodox Bible teaching. What's been handed down, what's been proven to work. You see, the Bible is the basis of our faith. We don't worship the Bible. I, I do get worried sometimes when I hear us talk about being people of the book. That's Muslims. That's how they view the Quran. We base ourselves on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because the Bible reveals Jesus to us. You see, Jesus is the centre, the, the cornerstone of our faith, and the Holy Spirit, God's powerful presence, comes to us to bring the Bible to life so that it may speak into our hearts. You see, authentic, orthodox Bible teaching glorifies God. It exalts Jesus. It releases the power of the Holy Spirit abroad in our lives. It builds up the church. And any time we depart from the faith once delivered, then we focus on ourselves, we promote division, and we stifle the work of the Holy Spirit. It's been said of the church that we can, we should always be reforming ourselves, semper referendum as it comes to us in Latin. But we as individuals should always be reforming our lives according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, in alignment with God's word, building on a solid foundation. That's Jesus. The hymn put it like this, how firm a foundation you saints of the Lord is built for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? For you unto Jesus for refuge hath fled. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 11, Paul writes this, for no one can lay any foundation other than one that has been laid, that foundation is Jesus Christ. So submit yourselves to the teaching and the authority of God's word. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring the word of God alive within you. Run after Bible teaching, seek it, that's recognised and proven to be authentic by others. You know, authentic faith feeds, nourishes and strengthens the soul. In our climate, in our culture today, there are so many people who set themselves up as authorities. They'll tell you about their self-help. 
um, books that they write. They'll tell you about three easy steps or seven ways uh, to live the, uh, a victorious or a successful Christian life. But you need to stand on God's word. Authentic faith feeds, nourishes, strengthens the soul and causes us to love God more. That's the test of a faith that nourishes, that has strong and firm foundations. In Matthew chapter 7, in the, at the end of the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus says these words, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. In other words, build your life on the rock that is Jesus. Lay firm foundation. Secondly, build diligently. Build diligently. Firm foundations and then build diligently. Conform your life to the example of God's word and take regular stock of your life spiritually. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone, the old hymn puts it. Absolutely. When was the last time you sat still for long enough in God's presence to be able to say, Master, speak, your servant is listening? We're in so much of a hurry. Actually, that's one of the very few things that's been positive during this global pandemic is it has perhaps forced some of us to stop and listen to the Lord. Our intellect, our actions, our conscience, our motives, our imaginations all need to be conformed to the mind of Christ. You see, in verse 3, what I read earlier, Titus, um, Jude encourages us to be faithful to the gospel and the body of teaching that brought us to the faith. Contend for it, agonise over it, fight for it, love it, like an athlete engaged in arm-to-arm -arm wrestling. It's worth struggling for. There's a prize. We don't maintain our salvation by trying harder, but by making the efforts to let God's work have free flow in our lives. By keeping on and by leaning on God's grace. This week I discovered again a recording of an old hymn I remember from my youth being taught to sing. Just lean upon the arms of Jesus. He'll help you along. Help you along. Psalm 9 and verse 9 says, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. One of the reasons that we are to build diligently is that we have a shelter then from the storms of life. We must take care of ourselves spiritually, listening to God, reading the Bible, leading lives that simply make space for God to speak to us by abstaining from things for a, few, for a period of time, fasting, fasting from food, fasting from hobbies, sometimes even fasting from relationships that might do us harm. Centre ourselves anew on God. Give in secret. Encourage others. Learn new disciplines. Ask for God's Spirit to come into you and give you gifts that you've never had before, but that you can be used by you to bless others. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 puts it like this, where the Apostle Paul says to the leaders of the church in Ephesus, as he's taking his leave of them, I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. That's what Jude is saying to us here. Build yourselves up. Protect yourselves, particularly in times of difficulty. How do you do that? By building diligently, by taking care of the things that sustain your Christian life. It's not enough just to be accidental in your following of Jesus. Somebody once said, if you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. 
So be diligent as you seek to build yourself up in the faith. So build on solid foundations, build diligently, and lastly, grow healthy Christian relationships. Christian fellowship and support has been hit hard by this global pandemic. It's hard at the moment, but the ways in which we're still able to connect through technology serving us, life groups, small groups, relationships with other Christians in the local church are still somehow available to us if we'll just be imaginative. You see, lack of mutual accountability in the Christian life is a dangerous thing. I get worried when people say to me, oh, it's just between me and my God. The Christian life was never meant to be lived that way. We are meant, we were created for relationships, both with God and for one another. Right back at the beginning of the creation story in Genesis, God says it is not good for man to be alone. Beware of individualism. It's a heresy that's been there right from the start. Heresy seeks to isolate people, but authentic Christian teaching builds people up in relationship. You see, a a building or a brick cannot be built into a building unless it's on the building site. And we're called to be built into a holy temple, the Apostle Peter says. To be a construction, to be uh, that which glorifies God, that's, that's seen. Jesus said, by this shall all people know that you're my disciples, by your love one for another, one another, togetherness. You know, it is difficult in these days, but we are still encouraged to maintain connection. So let me say to you, when was the last time you picked up the phone and asked somebody, not just how are they doing and what they had for supper last night, but how are they doing in their faith? When was the last time uh, that you actually said to somebody, do you know what, Let's, uh, what can I pray for you? How can I build you up? We continue to offer daily prayer online here as a church, every day. Um, there's an opportunity for you to pray and to know that you're connecting with other Christians as we read God's word, as we intercede for our world every single day. It's really important that we continue to connect. There's a daily Bible verse that we're sending out that you can sign up to receive. And if you're watching this this morning, then there's no reason at all why you can't sign up to receive that, both through Facebook and Instagram And there's a word for the week every Wednesday, a word that's published, a short devotional to seek to encourage us in our faith. You see, Jude will go on to say that prayer and love and patience are really important ways in which we continue to grow. Because to grow spiritually is so important if we are to maintain a vibrant and an attractive Christian witness. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In other words, that through what we say and we do, God would be glorified. So build yourselves up in your faith by reading the Bible, by praying, by listening for God's voice by the Holy Spirit, by fellowship, by being diligent in putting into practice what you know to be true. And let me just say, as we come to the end of this teaching, don't become more confident in your own opinion. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Ask for the help of the Holy Spirit as you seek to turn obedience to the word of God into a living reality in your life so that Jesus may be better known. May God bless each one of us as we seek, yes, to be built up in our most holy faith. To him be the glory. Amen.
let's pray for our world. Lord God, we pray for the ministry of um, Elam. We pray for their work in Iran. Pray that you would give them the uh, wisdom and grace to work there in the way that you would have them. Just pray for their work in, in taking Bibles there. I pray that you bless that work and that you'd um, enable the Bibles to be taken to the right people, that they'd be able to read them and they'd be able to understand. We just pray for uh, the work they do with persecuted Christians. Lord, there are so many people in our world who um, are persecuted for their faith. Lord, we thank you for um, our our world. We thank you for um, the work of Elam and other others that are helping the persecuted church. Just pray that you'd bless them. You'd help them to continue to um, support people and to show love and uh, care for those people who are persecuted and to um, also to know the best way to support them. Just pray as well, Lord, for um, our church. Pray that you'd help us to uh, care and uh, love each other, even though we're um, distant at the moment. Just pray that you'd help us to look after those in our world that really need your support and your care at this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh 
So let's close our service in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we give ourselves into your hands. Grant us grace to see you, to know your way, to feel you near. Find us now in the quiet places of our hearts and hold us fast, we pray, in the haste of the day. For your glory's sake, we pray together. Amen.